Imagine a government that fears its own people, a system where open debate is seen as a threat, where gatherings are suspicious, and where wealth is deliberately drained from the masses. Sounds familiar? This isn't just a description of any modern authoritarian state. This is tyranny as Aristotle described it over 2,300 years ago. And he wasn't just theorizing about tyranny. He had personal experience with tyrants from multiple angles. As a young man in Athens, he witnessed the aftermath of the rule of the 30 tyrants. And later in life, Aristotle had a close relationship with Hermias, who was the tyrant of Atanus. Combined with his studies, these personal exposures to tyranny provided Aristotle with a keen insight into the nature of tyrannical rule. They provided him with a nuanced understanding of how tyranny affects both societies and individuals and how philosophical principles can stand in opposition to tyrannical power. For Aristotle, tyranny wasn't just about cruel dictators. It was an entire system of governance, an institution designed to perpetuate unjust rule. And understanding it might be just as relevant today as it was back then. But why should we care about an ancient Greek philosopher's thoughts on government? Because Aristotle's insights provide a framework for understanding political systems that goes far beyond his time. His analysis helps us recognise both the subtle and the not-so-subtle ways in which power can be misused, even in societies that claim to be free. Aristotle's analysis helps us make sense of political phenomena so we can see it in our own rulers. So let's start our journey into the mind of one of history's greatest political thinkers and see what light he can shed on the dark corners of tyrannical rule. Aristotle's concept of tyranny is far more nuanced than our modern notion of oppressive rule. As mentioned, he presents it as a distinct political institution with specific characteristics. In his monumental work, Politics, he dissects tyranny itself. He shows us how it's different from other forms of government, including those with a single ruler. A king and a tyrant might both hold absolute power, but for Aristotle, the distinction lies in how that power is used and for what purpose. At its foundation, Aristotle defines tyranny as a system of governance that exists for the benefit of the rulers rather than the governed. But what does this mean in practice? Tyranny, in Aristotle's view, is a corruption of legitimate forms of government. It combines all the bad elements of both oligarchy and democracy, taking the concentration of wealth from the former and the disregard for law and tradition from the latter. Interestingly, Aristotle notes that tyrants are often chosen from the meanest group of people. This suggests that tyranny isn't simply imposed from above, but can arise from within the population, especially in times of social upheaval. The result is a society where law becomes subservient to the ruler's will, state resources are used for personal gain rather than public good, and traditional checks on power are disrespected and eliminated. This stands in contrast to Aristotle's conception of a true king. While both a tyrant and a king might wield absolute power, the key distinction lies in the purpose of their rule. A tyrant governs for personal gain, a king respects the law and traditions and rules for the welfare of the community. Crucially, if the people no longer want the king's rule, a true king will willingly abdicate, something unthinkable for a tyrant. Aristotle argues that this situation makes tyranny inherently unstable. When a government systematically prioritises the interests of its rulers and their friends over the populace, it generates widespread discontent. In essence, Aristotle sees tyranny not just as bad leadership, but as a fundamental perversion of government's purpose. It's an institution that inverts the very reason for political community, using the state as a tool for the advantage of the few rather than the welfare of all. But how does such a system come to be? Aristotle's analysis goes beyond the cliché of a foreign conqueror or a king's son who becomes tyrannical. While that is sometimes the case, tyranny is rarely caused by conquest. According to Aristotle, tyranny often emerges from within existing political systems, particularly democracies and oligarchies. The path to tyranny, he argues, is paved with popular support and clever manipulation of societal divisions. In democracies, Aristotle observes that tyrants often start as demagogues, charismatic leaders who gain popularity by championing the cause of the common people against the elite. They promise to address social inequalities and redistribute wealth. Let's look at a historical example, Pisistratus in Athens. Pisistratus rose to power in the 6th century BC by positioning himself as a champion of the common people. He famously staged an attack on himself to gain public sympathy and a significant personal security force, which he then used to seize the Acropolis. 
Despite twice being overthrown, Pisistratus regained power each time through a combination of popular support and strategic alliances, eventually establishing a tyranny that lasted until his death. In oligarchies, tyranny can arise when one member of the ruling elite outmaneuvers the others, consolidating power for themselves. This might happen through political scheming, election fraud, or by appealing to the disenfranchised masses for support against their fellow oligarchs. Aristotle notes that times of social and economic upheaval are particularly ripe for the emergence of tyrants. When there's widespread discontent with the current system, people become more willing to support radical changes, even at the cost of their political freedoms. In other words, the rise of a tyrant isn't just about one person's ambition, it's a symptom of deeper institutional and societal issues, including political dysfunction, economic disparities, and the failure of existing systems to meet the needs of the populace. Aristotle's study of tyranny revealed a consistent set of methods that tyrants use to keep their power. His observations give us insight into how tyranny worked in ancient times and, surprisingly, how it might look even today. Let's break down these tactics. Aristotle noticed that tyrants often start by going after the rich and influential in society, by getting rid of prominent citizens, either through exile or worse, and taking away their wealth, tyrants eliminate potential rivals. He mentions how Periander of Corinth took away the property of the nobles. This tactic serves multiple purposes. It removes alternative leaders, weakens traditional power structures, often fills the tyrant's own pockets, and can gain support from common people by painting the tyrant as a champion against rich oppressors. But tyrants don't stop there. Aristotle observed that they also actively work to keep the general population poor. It is a device of tyranny to make the subjects poor, he writes. This isn't just cruel, it's strategic. People struggling to make ends meet don't have the time or resources to oppose the government. They're too focused on daily survival. And tyrants often start huge building projects too, like the pyramids in Egypt. While they might seem impressive, Aristotle saw their true purpose, draining people of resources while keeping them busy, making everyone dependent on the state. Tyrants also encourage people to inform on each other, even rewarding those who report on their neighbours. This breeds a climate of suspicion where no one knows whom to trust. As Aristotle writes, for a tyranny is not destroyed until some men come to trust each other. Instead of allowing free discussion and learning, tyrants promote their own narratives. They control what information is available to the public, shaping what people know and think. This approach prevents people from developing the critical thinking skills and knowledge that might lead them to question the tyrant's rule. He also noted that tyrants often prefer foreign soldiers and administrators over their own people. It is a mark of a tyrant to have men of foreign extraction rather than citizens as guests at table and companions, feeling that citizens are hostile but strangers make no claim against him. Aristotle writes. He then talks about how foreigners are more willing to act against the local population if ordered to. Constant surveillance was another tactic Aristotle observed. The tyrant should know what every man is saying or doing, he writes. In his time, this meant networks of spies and informants, such as the provocatrices of Syracuse. The goal is to make people feel they're always being watched, leading them to censor themselves out of fear and to catch those who speak their mind. Also, Tyrants often invent or exaggerate external threats. Keeping the state always ready for war allows them to demand sacrifices from the people and label any opposition as treason. Aristotle saw how some tyrants engage their subjects in war for the purpose of keeping them in need of a leader. This diverts attention from problems at home and lets the tyrant play the role of necessary protector. Perhaps one of the cleverest tactics Aristotle noticed was how tyrants handle existing institutions. Instead of destroying respected offices or councils, smart tyrants change them from within. They might keep the outward appearance of courts or assemblies, but strip away their real power. This lets tyrants claim their following tradition and respecting long-standing laws while actually controlling everything themselves. What's crucial to understand is that these tactics don't work alone. They form a system, reinforcing each other, to create a cycle of oppression that's hard to break once it's established. The tyrant aims at three things, Aristotle writes, to keep his subjects humble, to perpetuate mutual distrust among men, and to cut them off from political life. Tyranny becomes entrenched not just through force, but by reshaping how society itself works. Despite the numerous tactics tyrants use to maintain power, 
Aristotle observed that tyrannies are often the least stable form of government. But why is that? What causes the downfall of tyrants? Aristotle identified several key factors. First and foremost, he noted that tyrannies often fall due to the intense hatred they generate among the population. This hatred, Aristotle says, can lead to bold acts of resistance, even at great personal risk. Interestingly, Aristotle points out that tyrannies can also collapse due to contempt. If a tyrant is seen as weak, stupid, or otherwise incompetent, people might be emboldened to challenge their rule. He gives the example of Sardanapalus, who was reportedly overthrown after he was seen combing hair with his women, or Dionysius of Syracuse, who was attacked for being a drunkard. Another cause Aristotle identified is internal conflict within the tyrants in a circle. Those who are close to the tyrant might conspire to overthrow them out of personal ambition or fear. This is particularly likely if the tyrant's chosen successors are seen as unworthy or if there's competition for influence. He also noted that external pressures can lead to a tyrant's downfall. Other states, especially democracies or aristocracies, might support opposition movements or directly intervene to overthrow a tyranny. Perhaps most intriguingly, Aristotle observed that some tyrannies fall not through violent overthrow, but through a gradual relaxation of control. Some tyrants or their successors seeking to reduce the hatred against them might voluntarily give up some of their power, inadvertently opening the door to further reforms. Finally, Aristotle makes a crucial distinction between tyrants who seize power themselves and those who inherit it. He notes that most of those who have won tyrannies by their own effort have managed to keep their offices until the end. However, those who inherit tyrannies almost all lose them quickly. Why? Because these inheritors often live degenerate lives, making them despicable in the eyes of the people and providing opportunities for their opponents to get rid of him. In all these cases, Aristotle saw the seeds of a tyrant's destruction in the very nature of tyranny itself. The oppression and self-interest that define tyrannical rule ultimately generate the forces that eventually bring about its downfall. As we wrap up our exploration of Aristotle's insights on tyranny, I'd love to hear from you. Do you see any parallels between these ancient observations and modern governments? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this video valuable and want to support more content like this, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us continue doing historical research and sharing it with you. And as a bonus, you'll get access to audio-only versions of our content for listening in your car, on your daily run, or whatever you enjoy doing. Thank you for watching.